talk now a little bit about the relationship between the sine wave components of the sound and the perception that the, the sound creates, the perception uh, qualities of the sound. <coughs> um, before that, I would like to, to say, since the comment came up uh, in the break, part of the reason that we are emphasizing this type of uh, frequency decomposition, the structure of the sound in different frequencies is because, as you will see later, I alluded to that at the beginning of uh, my presentation, um, the auditory system does that. Okay. The first thing that happens in the auditory system is frequency decomposition. Not exactly a spectrogram, but something that's uh, uh, sufficiently similar to a spectrogram um, in order for the spectrogram to be a good representation, a, a reasonable uh, zero approximation to what happens early in the auditory system. Okay, so this is not only formal uh, analysis of sound the waveform, but also an introduction to what's going on in the ear. Okay, so first of all, <coughs> sine waves. Okay, so what are the properties of sine waves? Sine waves are defined by three numbers, basically. Okay, the first one is the frequency. <coughs> okay, here are sine waves. Uh, here are sine waves with two different frequencies. Okay, so the green one is uh, slow. The blue one is fast. It changes much, much faster. So this is one property. Here's the second property. These are two sine waves that have the same frequency. Okay, but they have, they are different. The thing that they are different is, their, the thing that's different is their amplitude. Okay, in Hebrew, Misra'at. Okay, so these are two sine waves with the same frequency and different um, amplitudes. And this is a third property that you need in order to define a sine wave. It's the, basically the position along the x-axis, along the time axis, and it's called phase. We talk very little about that. It's when you play a sine wave, a pure sine wave, its phase doesn't matter. It always sounds the same. Okay? If you add up many sine waves to create a complex sound waveform, then the phase is very important. Okay, but uh, I'm going just to skip that. Okay? We'll not talk about spaces. Now, for <coughs> sine waves, the issue of the relationship between the physical properties of the, of the sound, the frequency, the amplitude, and the phase, and the way that you perceive it is very simple. Okay. The frequency of the sine wave is identical to its pitch. Pitch is the, it's the, the thing with which you sing melodies. Okay, it's the gobat go sleeve. Okay. Uh, so the frequency of the sine wave is the pitch. The amplitude of the sine wave is roughly its loudness. And the phase is unimportant. Okay, so the question now is what happens to perception when, when we start to <coughs> add them up? Okay, so this is a sign with a frequency, a sine wave with a frequency of 500 hertz. slightly distorted sine wave with, with, uh, it would have been a sine wave if it, if it would not be distorted. Okay, that's a better approximation of sine wave. By the way, it's extremely difficult to recreate sine waves with loudspeakers. And the loudspeakers, if, even if you try to drive them with a sine wave, they would generate uh, all kinds of distortions. So it's the hardest sound by far to create with, uh, with, loud, with loudspeakers. Okay, so what are the re relationships between these two sounds? Different <laughs> octave, <laughs> okay. This is a subtle, subtle point, yes. They have the one octave apart. Okay, now we have a tendency to think about sounds that are one octave apart as in some sense being the same. 
זה so called octave equivalent. They are obviously not the same, okay, but they have some sort of similarity that makes them uh, make us treat them as if they were close to each other. Okay. Now, the, the reason this, the 1000 hertz is one octave above the 500 hertz sound is because 1000 is twice, is twice 500. So an octave relationship is in multiplying by two the frequency. Okay, so we have now two sounds which are one octave apart. Okay, now let's li listen to the sum. Okay, what will be, what do you guess is going to happen? Okay. Many of you will not know what will happen. to the pitch of the 500 hertz. Note that it's not the same sound. Okay, here's the 500 hertz. And here's the sum. Okay, they are different. Yeah, if I put you, if I, if I make you, if I test you, okay, and uh, ask you whether the sound are the same or different, okay, and there is a difference between them that I hope most of you can perceive. Okay, this difference is, belongs to the class of phenomena that we called timber, gavan. Okay, so they have the same pitch, they have the same height, sound height. If you play a melody, they can serve in the same place in the melody, that's the pitch. Okay, but they are different, and the difference is a difference in timbre. In a okay, here's the third uh, wave, a uh, sine wave. Okay, what's the musical interval between this and this? Yeah, that's a fifth. Yeah, so this is a fifth. A fifth is the frequency ratio of 2 to 3. So this is twice 500 and this is 3 times 500. Okay, so the ratio between, the, the interval between them is, is 1 fifth. Now what will happen if I add this one to the sound? The pitch is still 500 hertz. Okay, now, why is the pitch 500 hertz? Let's look at the waveform. Okay, this is the time waveform in your ear. Okay, it re repeats itself many, many times. Okay, I have here only something like uh, three and a half repeats on the screen, it repeats itself 500 <coughs> times per second, this shape. Okay, just to convince you that it, it really repeats itself 500 times per second, what I plotted here in green now is the 500 hertz tone. You can see that the 500 hertz tone and the complex thing, the sum of many harmonics, have the same periodicity. They repeat, it, they repeat themselves the same number of times. <coughs> the uh, in time, the period in time is the same. Okay, so... I'll get back to that. Okay, so I need to go through the definition. Okay, we have what I did here was to add up sine waves with frequencies that share harmonic relationship. Okay, now uh, one frequency is the harmonic of another one if it's a multiple of that lower harmonic. Okay, so for example, each frequency is the first harmonic of itself. 300 hertz will be the third harmonic of 100 hertz and the second harmonic of 150 hertz. 
Um, there's an issue of terminology here from musicologists sometimes use the term overtone. Okay, so 300 is the first overtone of 150 hertz, but it's the second harmonic of 150 hertz. Okay, 150 hertz is the first harmonic of 150 hertz. Uh, now, note that I said that it should be a small multiple of the lower, of the lower harmonic, because 300 hertz is also the 300 harmonics of one hertz. Okay, but this doesn't count. Now, as I showed you before, two sine waves with frequencies that have harmonic relationships share a periodicity. Okay, the period, they have a common period, which is the period of the lower frequency one. Okay, the 100, the 1000 hertz tone is also periodic at 500 hertz. Okay, the 1500 hertz tone is also periodic at 500 hertz. Okay, so the sum is therefore periodic with the same period. Okay, and this is okay. I need to say that. Okay, that's the this is the point I wanted to get to. Okay, so pitch is determined by the periodicity of the sound. Okay, pitch, obviously, the same again, the same, the property of sound with which you play uh, melodies is really the periodicity of the sound waveform, not the frequency, but <coughs> the periodicity of the sound waveform. Okay, so the pitch of a sound is equal to its periodicity, and uh, <coughs> I want to. Uh, to illustrate that, with a small demo. Okay, so what I will do here is to run you through a psychophysical experiment that's called the pitch matching experiment. And this is the way that psychoacousticians determine the pitch of a sound. Okay, so in order to determine the pitch of a sound that you never heard before, uh, you use a known yardstick, sounds for which you know what the pitch is, and these are sound, these are pure sine waves, pure sine waves. So what you are going to hear now are alternately, okay, a pure sine wave and the sound which is not a pure sine wave. It's a squeaky sound, okay. Its, it's frequency is above or below that of the sine wave? Above. Okay, so what you do in pitch matching, you shift the frequency of the sine wave. Okay, are they the same? Okay, what do they do? Okay, so at this point, we're going 
got loudness, that's basically the amplitude of the sound. You've got speech, it's a periodicity of the sound. I told you that I don't know what contour is. Duration is duration. Okay, it's the short sound and long sound. There's no difficulty in that. Okay, I'm not discussing tempo. And I will not talk about spatial location and reverberation, which are processes that have to do with the sound getting to the two ears at the same time. Okay, so what we are left with is thunder. Now, <coughs> the problem with this number is that it's a kind of a leftover property. Sometimes people say that everything that's not loudness and pitch is thunder. Okay, so it's a bad definition. It's a definition by default. Uh, and uh, this... Uh, uh, this, it, it is really complex. It, it's going to depend on many, many different acoustic features. Okay, so the first thing that uh, determines thunder, and we already had a uh, demonstration of that, is the presence of harmonics and those specific levels. So I always, when I synthesized this 500 health sound and added to it harmonics, okay, I gave you a feeling for the fact that when we add up harmonics to a, to a, a bass tone, we get a different, a different standard, <coughs> same pitch, but different standard. Okay, so I want to <coughs> demonstrate this a little bit uh, in more detail. So I use an illustration that um, no created for me a while ago. Okay, so this is uh, for the know the melody. Okay, and what were the instruments? Not really. Maybe yeah, maybe synthesize fluidly, but it's uh, okay. So here's another instrument. So this is officially a horn, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here are the two uh, sound waveforms, <coughs> the first line waveform of the whole thing. Okay, and um, this is the flute, this is the horn. Okay, and you s always, all, all the time, you see the same two segments here. Okay, now, what I want to emphasize is that they have the same periodicity, okay? Every time you have a repeated pattern here, here you also have a repeated pattern there, okay? But the repeated patterns are not the same, okay? The horn has a different structure in time than the flute, okay? So the fact that the periodic periodicity is the same, that's what makes the melody the same, the same pitch at each point in time. At this point, I hope uh, uh, this makes sense. And the timbre is related to the fact that these two things look different. In order to construct this periodic form, you need different harmonics, different levels of harmonics than the one that you need in order to create that, that periodic waveform. Okay, so let's look at the harmonics that are needed in order to create these. Okay, so what you see here are the full spectrogram of the whole melody. Okay, the each, so again, this is time, this is, <coughs> we have here time, we have here frequency. You can see that this, the, the, this ladder structure that these are the harmonics. Okay, I have a basic sound and all these multiples. 
Okay, there are some other things here too. We we'll, we'll talk about them in a moment. Now, the basic the ba the basic sound of the harmonics we see here is this one. Okay, and you can see the melody here. Okay, I'm not going to sing, but uh, okay, ta 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 So, uh, so this is basically this basically what the media representation tells you is this. Okay, this is what it gives you. The specific instrument that you are using in the media gives you the additional the harmonic structure, roughly. Okay, it's much more complicated than that. We'll see it in a moment. Okay, so this is the flute, and below you have the horn. So here the things in a at higher resolution. Okay, and you can see the difference in the harmonic structure between them. The harmonics and the amplitudes are different in the flute and in the horn. Okay, so that's part of what gives you the difference in the timbre between the two instruments. Now, this is not all. Okay, the, what I want to do now is to show you that the harmonics by themselves are not enough to create, uh, to fully create the feel of a sound. And for that purpose, I took a small piece of the flute, it's just the first long note. Okay. And I'm going to create it from harmonics. Okay, so I'm going now to do the exercise of actually constructing this from, from harmonics, and then uh, we look at the result of the construction and compare it with the original ones to see what's, what's left. Okay, so for that purpose, I need to know what the harmonics are and what are the levels. Okay, so I calculated here the, all the contribution of all frequencies, and these lines, okay, these are the harmonics. I'm going to use, so first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. <coughs> I'm going to use here uh, uh, seven harmonics to construct the flute sound. Okay, and the result of the construction is this green line. Okay, so again, the seven harmonics, I don't get a... Uh, I don't get the full thing, I get a pretty good representation of it. Not an identity, not uh, I didn't get it identically. Uh, and now we can again, we can listen okay, to the original sound, to the flute sound. And this is the synthesized sound. Okay. You hear the difference? Yeah. What's the difference? one is more complex, but uh, what are the, for me, one of the major differences between them is the feeling of sort of a uh, hushed kiss that goes on to the foot sound, and that is not present in the, in the sound that I synthesized. Okay, and that's again, that's the part of the sound of the foot. <coughs> Cleaner, it doesn't have this uh, noisy background. 
of the symbol of the flute, and it's not the harmonics. Okay, so it's another component of the sound, okay, which is there and which is important for creating a natural feeling. If I only add up harmonics, I will, end, I, I will always end up with something that sounds a bit uh, artificial. It's interesting that one of these students, I know, someone who said it also, he lacks this Vibrato. Vibrato, yes. And uh, we'll get to the vibrato in a moment. Yeah. But uh, now, when if you try to focus on this, you can you can listen to this micro micromodulation. Micromodulation. Yeah. Now another thing that belongs to another property of sound. So we have the <coughs> hiss. We have the micromodulation. I will get a, a very strong example of that in a moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have all kinds of temporal, slow temporal modulation. The micromodulation <coughs> of the pitch is one of them that's uh, important for the uh, important for the uh, tim tim timbre of the of the sound. So, which instrument do I play now? <laughs> which instrument instrument was that? make it more uh, <coughs> which instrument is it? Oh. <laughs> Sounds like a plug more like a plug string. All I did here was to take the flute sound and multiply it by a slow decay. Okay, so instead of having being the same amplitude throughout the sound, it decreases very fast to zero. And that's uh, so. In, in a way, I made a, a guitar or, or pizzicato on a violin out of the out of the flute simply by uh, changing its temporal structure by putting this uh, <coughs> uh, decaying. Um, uh, wave form on it. So this, is a, when I, at the beginning, when uh, I described the piano sound, I said that there are these modulations that occur on time scales of a few tens of milliseconds, and they are important for the timbre of sound. Um, I didn't do it here, but uh, if you take a violin or a flute and put on each one of its notes this type of decay, you will end up by something that sounds like the same melody played on a guitar. Okay, so this slow modulation, again, are very important for creating the, uh, the sense of, uh, of the, of the, the sound of the, of the instrument. And what I want to do here is to illustrate the role of the micromodulation of pitch. Okay, so this is, it's originally, it's an example of a uh, chowning. Okay, the was what was it? Was an engineer in politics? He built the first synthesizer, basically. Okay, and uh, here's the, the example. So I start with a few tones.
micromodulation that occur at rate of a uh, few tenths per second are again uh, extremely important in uh, 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 creating the, the, the sound of the, of the, uh, of the sound. Okay, so So basically, much of the music that we are doing is done with uh, sound that evokes pitch, and pitch is something that, and by default, if it's in Western music, that's the thing that makes the music. <coughs> okay, that's uh, for the basic feature with which we do music. Okay, again, I'm exaggerating. But uh, this means that the sound that we are going to use in order to make music will be periodic or almost periodic. But the the beyond the periodicity which is expressed by the harmonic structure, by the fact that there are some harmonics, there's a huge amount of uh, uh, additional structure, okay, like the noise in the flute sound or the micromodulation that makes uh, an artificial chord like that sounds like human voice, uh, which are uh, um, extremely important and they affect our perception. At the end, if we want to, uh, if we want <coughs> to be able to have a full account of how we start with a sound and end up with music in our head, uh, we will, we need to be able to account for uh, all of these uh, the positive all, all of these uh, properties, and I can already tell you that our uh, understanding of physiology, the physiology of uh, many of these features is very poor. Okay, now, here's a question that Stalin likes. Okay. How come sine waves are so important? Okay, so part of that, I told you, is simply because the, this is what the ear does. Okay, the ear does a kind of a frequency, a frequency analysis. But it, it can, this cannot be uh, the, full <coughs> the full answer. Okay, there are many directions in which we can go, but one of them, one possible reason for which sine waves are so efficient at representing the musical sound is because sine waves arise quite naturally from the physics of uh, vibrating bodies, mostly of vibrating strings and vibrating vibrations in tubes. So, Nori already told you that to a first approximation, the way that we do voice is by using a tube, okay, it's a complex tube, but it's a tube that we change the shape, and uh, this is what creates voice, and what I want to show you here is uh, very fast the way that uh, string uh, the harmonics come up with strings. So this is a string, okay? You see it's a string. <laughs> So any sound
now that a string will make will be composed of, uh, of these harmonics. Exactly in the middle, okay, you probably notice that I excited only the uh, odd harmonics, like the first, third, fifth, and so on. Uh, the reason is that the second harmonic, okay, the, for the second harmonic, the string doesn't move in the middle, for the fourth harmonic, it doesn't move in the middle, and so on and so forth. Okay, the even harmonics do not. Uh, uh, for the, for the uh, even harmonics, the, this middle point of the string stays, uh, stays in its place, it doesn't move. So when I pluck at the middle of the string, I will excite only the, the, the odd harmonics. But if I pluck at a different place, I'm going to get all the harmonics. And also the sound sounds are different. Okay, it's like a string or a tube, would vibrate at a basic frequency, a fundamental frequency, and it's harmonic. And this means that uh, most of the things with which we do music, starting with our voice and, uh, and uh, going through string instruments, uh, uh, wind instruments, and all of these things that have mostly a one dimension, that are long but not wide, they would all create uh, sounds that are harmonic, that have harmonic structure. Okay. Now, the negative of this statement is that things that make music but that have two dimensions, like drums or bells, they would have uh, would be less. Uh, would they, they would still have a discrete modes of vibration, but the frequencies will not be related to each other like harmonic. So a drum is not. Uh, it doesn't sound like it has a uh, pitch unless you work very hard to make it on, uh, uh, to make it uh, uh, pitchy like when like uh, the uh, what is called the symphony of an orchestra. So you know, the construction of the symphony <coughs> emphasizes uh, some of the harmonics that uh, uh, are that some of the uh, some of the vibration modes that are in harmonic relationships. Okay, or uh, bells. In order to make, a, a, if, you type, if you just take metal and make a bell, it will sound very bad. Okay, the people who make bells, the people who make bells, and learn by experience to create shapes and to modify the shapes of what of the bells they created in order to emphasize uh, the vibration modes that are harmonic and to de-emphasize vibration modes that are not in harmonic series, and then the bells have this uh, the more musical sound. Okay, but uh, most of the things with which we do music are uh, things that have uh, mostly one dimension. Okay, strings, wind instruments, and so on and so forth, voice. And so these, uh, these things by nature create harmonic, harmonic series. Okay. So uh, I stop here. Next week, I'm going to look. The, this website should contain the list of uh, list of lectures. Okay, so you, so that you should know uh, what the subject of it is. Okay.